This man's name is Armin Walsh. He is the Indiana Jones of Tyrolean archaeologists. He's so enthusiastic. He's got all sorts of exciting plans. He wants to find all the medieval castles and you know, renovate them and turn them into museums. Takes a lot of money. When Armin needs money, he does not go to Vienna because he'll get nothing. He goes to Brussels. And he doesn't go to Brussels saying, I got a great project for Austria, even though he lives in Austria. He goes there and he says, I got something really cool for the Tyrol. Because the Tyrol is not a political uh, unit. The Tyrol is an ethnic region that ignores political boundaries, part in Austria and part in Italy. In fact, the town Tyrol, which the Tyrol is named after, is actually in Italy. Armin will come back with money from Austria because Austria is funding ethnic ventures like this because Europe likes the ethnic health of the continent. Now, when you join the European Union, you are either a net giver or a net receiver, depending on what your national economy is compared to the European average. If you're a wealthy country, you give more than you get. And you do it with a good spirit because you know you're a free trade zone and you're only as good as your weakest link, right? And if you're a poor country, you're lucky to be on board because you're gonna get subsidized by the rich countries until you lift your, your society up from an infrastructure and economy point of view. The first big iteration of the European Union, uh, uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, the three poor countries were Ireland, Portugal, and Greece. They were the net receivers. Back then, there were no freeways in those countries, almost literally no freeways. Today, they're laced with freeways. And with every new freeway in Portugal, I Ireland, and Greece, you will see a sign with a European flag on it. This one says, this project has received 85% financial assistance from the European Union. That means France and Germany. And that means, okay, we bought you these roads, now use them, work, produce. We're gonna keep up with America, you see. So that's this whole spirit of Europe investing in its infrastructure, like we did with our interstate system, I think, in the 50s. It was a smart move. Poor states, rich states all got federal money to make that infrastructure so we could have a mighty economy. All my life, I've been crossing the Gulf of Corinth with a little ferry. Then a couple of years, I go there, and there's this huge bridge. Bam, all of a sudden, in Greece, a big bridge. And I thought, Greeks don't build bridges like that. This is a, the Greeks would take the boat for the rest of time, okay? <laughs> this is a German bridge built by Germans for German trucks to get their gummy bears down to the Peloponnesian Peninsula. <laughs> and it just makes sense. Germany wants to have access to that market. Doesn't it make sense? So they invest, and that's a European Union uh, adventure. All over Europe, they're investing in their infrastructure. They've got sort of an internal Marshall Plan. It's quite exciting. I, I think about uh, uh, the stimulus spending. You know, I just, I just drove up the Oregon coast over all of these beautiful bridges that were built in the 1930s with stimulus spending. You know, it's, it's not burning money, it's, it's making work that is gonna stoke things up and try to have a, a long life. And 80 years later, these bridges are elegant and beautiful, made from a stimulus that brought us out of a depression way back then. Europe is investing in its infrastructure and it's got some sort of stimulus notion also. You go to Berlin now, it's got the biggest train station in all of Europe, the new Hauptbahnhof. Major train lines coming together on different levels at right angles. It's just breathtaking. I was in Munich recently taking pictures of trains coming into the station, specifically taking pictures of cute little birds squished onto the windshields of those trains. And I looked at that little dead bird and I thought two things. I thought, first of all, I thought, boy, this is a dangerous place if you're a slow bird. And then I thought you'd wait all your life to see a bird squished onto the windshield of a train where I live. You know, I just never even conceived of a bird squished onto the train. It just, trains don't go that fast in the United States. <laughs> but in Europe, it is really exciting to use those, to get on those bullet trains. Now you see this in your travels. And you don't see this as much as you used to, but you still do and you always will. Uh, you know, it's, I, I, I'm in, uh, you know, I promote tourism. I'm trying to sell tours, and I want my people to be happy when they go to Europe, and I, I don't want them to think Europeans don't like it. Well, you can be in Madrid, and, there's, and it's a city of four million people, and three million of them can be out in the streets in a driving rainstorm with anti-American banners, you know, if we go to a war that they don't agree in. I mean, Europeans just yell when they don't like something. And you see a lot of this Stop USA, 
And I just want to remind you, that doesn't mean anti-you or anti-me. It doesn't mean anti-America. It certainly doesn't mean anti-American values, American ideals, you know, what America is all about, this liberty and freedom and stuff. It is anti-American trade policies or anti-American military policies or they don't like what the president said or something like that. So they, they, they do that. It, it's sort of hurtful to see that, but you I gotta understand it's not against us or our country. It's against a trade policy generally. Now a lot of Americans wimp out and accessorize with this little uh, <laughs> bit of decoration. You know, that is really poor character, I gotta say. <laughs> you are an American, so, you know, deal with it. Don't fake your Canadians. <laughs> and besides that, it, you don't need to apologize for being an American. You, they'll accept you as an individual. If you're a unilateralist and you think we should be writing other people's textbooks, well, you can debate those people and you're gonna be outnumbered and they're pretty good debaters, you know. But if you're an open-minded type traveler, you'll find it's a blessing, it's a, it's a plus to be an American, okay? You don't need to hide the fact that you're American and you can travel anywhere in Europe and be warmly received. Uh, you know, we take a thousand people to uh, France every year in our tours and I'm very concerned that people have a good time and are received warmly. I survey these people after their trip and ask them how you were, were received and so on and nobody ever complains about the reception they receive in France. If you're a decent, open-minded traveler that's not pushing your values on them and you want to learn from them instead of teach them, you'll be warmly received and you'll enjoy the people that you meet. As a matter of fact, in France, and I, I use France as an example because a lot of Americans just can't handle the fact that France will not march into whatever military adventure we want them to march into. You know, they're, they're a self-respecting sovereign nation. They're not gonna follow us into every war we choose to go in. Uh, and uh, it, it just hurts them to see us pouring out fine French wine. I guess that's a very, very, it confuses Europeans to see us pouring out French wine uh, when they won't join us in a war. Um, I was filming in the most traditional conservative part of France, uh, Burgundy. And when I'm filming, I got work to do. I'm not very polite, I don't have time to party. I'm coming, I've been going to this mom and pop chateau for years. Uh, this adorable couple that's been in their family for ages. And I come in and I say, uh, the sun's going down, I need to get up on the roof for a, to get a wide shot of the ramparts, you know. And they say, no, first we must have a little party. No, the sun's going down, I gotta, we gotta make our TV show. No, first we must have a party. Okay, let's have a party. And um, they bring on the nice wine and the cookies, and the crackers and the cheese, and then, like a, sort of almost like a religious relic, they bring out this precious 48-star American flag that they hoisted over their chateau on that great day in 1944 when their village was liberated from Nazi tyranny by American troops. And they say, we want you to go home and tell your friends that we will always be thankful for the valor and the love of America when we were in our darkest days, you know. And I guess I could give a whole talk on anecdotal uh, examples of how Europeans have reminded me how thankful they are for us standing up against the Nazis and the Soviet Union. And our might has been really critical for European freedom and, and what they're enjoying today. Uh, but there's a disconnect when, when Americans think that they should, because of that, follow us in all of our policies now. It's just, there's, there's no rationality there. Um, so it's something you gotta think about in your travels and, and give Europeans an understanding that they are appreciative of what we've done for them. Europeans celebrate that the strength of America, when Reagan said Gorbachev tear down this wall, that was a very powerful statement. And Europe, most Europeans believe that it was American economic might that outlasted Russia in the Cold War the arms race was a battle of economic attrition, very expensive for us, it left us in debt, but it collapsed the Soviet Union and thank goodness we got out of the Cold War without a hot war. Uh, and today there's no threat from Russia to Europe like there might have been without the United States.